your science policy meetings. And, and, I mean, how did those get started? I mean, when, when you invited the civil servants, by, I mean, was was it, that was your initiative? Yeah. What, what, what happened was was uh, what happened was this. Um, uh, I was at Sydney and I was sitting at lunch, talking to a member of King's, uh, uh, Alan Hughes, who had been undergraduate here, mm. and uh, he is a fellow of, of Sydney. And this was shortly after the 1997 election mm. had taken place. And he said um, that the LSE, whilst thinking of putting on or had arranged for a programme of several seminars we put on for, for ministers on matters to do with government. Um, and I, I'm not sure whether Tony was there then. Um, Gittins. Tony Gittins. Tony Gittins. I'm not sure whether he was there then. Anyway, uh, as it happened, that never came off, those seminars. No. <coughs> for specific for ministers never came off. Um, but I, I said to Alan, oh my God, um, Cambridge has got such strengths in, mm. in science and medicine technology. Mm. I wonder whether we shouldn't put this at the disposal of, um, of the government. Mm. Now, I knew nothing about, really I should have known more, because I, I knew of course knew Solly Zuckerman, he was then, had been chief scientist mm. advisor of the mm. government, mm. but it absolutely never crossed my mind uh, um, uh, that I should have approached the chief scientist chief science advisor about this. I mean, I just went off and I wrote a letter to the Vice Chancellor, Alec Brewers, and said, well, why don't we put, I forgot, it was a very simple letter about putting in the disposal yeah, of yeah. arranging, I'm not sure whether I said arranging seminars, but something of that sort. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I sent a copy of the letter to John Eatwell. Now, John Eatwell had just made president of, uh, of Queen's yeah. and had just come on to the heads of houses committee, you know. Yeah. Um, um, and he was very effective on that committee. He spoke well and mm. clearly, and he was a good communicator. And I thought, well, I'll send this letter to Alec Brewers, and I'll send one to Johnny. Of course, after all, I was impressed by him. I liked yeah. his, his, the, the way he spoke up yeah. uh, and the clarity of thinking, and and because he was a member of the upper house. Mm. Anyway, yes. So uh, I, I I failed to get a reply. Uh, and one day I was walking with um, Alec Brewers after we'd been to a dinner together. This is such an extraordinary Cambridge experience, really. Uh, we'd been at a, a dinner together and we were walking along Sydney Street, as I recall. <coughs> and I said to him, uh, um, uh, you haven't replied to my letter. What letter? He said. I said, that letter about the, the seven hours, you know, for mm -hmm. ministers. And he said, I have replied. Um, and so, I, the, so we actually stood on the corner of, of, of the opposite, opposite Sydney Sussex College, and, and we actually had a row. <laughs> it was extraordinary. He and you I, your I, job? No, 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 uh, no. The vice chancellor, oh, uh, right. and myself. He had been in post now for some months, and uh, he yeah. and I were on this corner about yeah. eleven thirty at night, <laughs> having this rather vigorous discussion about mm. his failures. Um, and then he. He walked off in a real huff. And by the way, I hope this isn't going to be produced until after he and I are gone. <laughs> he walked off in a real huff, and I rushed after him. I grabbed his arm. I said, Alex, uh, if you can't listen to your friends, who can you listen to? <coughs> so he said, yeah, I'm sorry. Next day he wrote and said, he, sorry, hadn't written, hadn't replied. It was a ridiculous idea. We don't have the money. We can't do this sort of thing. It was a three-liner. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I spoke to John Eat. Well, I remember John coming across to see me at the lodge at Sydney, the Master's Lodge. And I uh, showed him the letter, and mm. I said, Well, we, you know, we, we can't move without the universal support. Mm. And John said, Yes, we can. Look, it won't cost us any money. They'll pay for their travel. You know. So I. I thought, well, yeah, I suppose that, that must be true. I had been thinking of doing it on a rather grand scale yeah. through the university, yeah. where when I suddenly realised that, yes, of course we could do it. Yes. And, yes, of course, he said, you know, we, we're all we'd have to pay for a lunch, sandwich lunches. Yes. Um, so 
And I think this is one of the remarkable things that it could only happen in a place like Cambridge and possibly Oxford. I don't see how it could in a devolved yes. university, yeah. where, the, where, where it's like um, a federation of states. Yes. And uh, John and I then thought, well, who could we have on this committee beside ourselves? John being political economy, yeah. me being a biomedical scientist. So I wanted a physical scientist. So you had all the physical sciences, you know, the engineering, yeah, yeah. technological, or me doing bio biology yeah. and And we thought we'd have a lawyer. So we had four heads of houses on it. We had, we invited uh, Dave King, who was master of Downing and head of chemistry. Yeah. We invited Bob Heppel, who was then master of Clare and professor of English law, I think, anyway, yeah. law. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was John and myself. So there were four heads of houses. And um, we, uh, at that time, uh, there was a tremendous turmoil in the press about cloning, organism of cloning, yes, you yes. know, uh, Dolly the Sheep had come yeah. into existence. And although John Gurdon had cloned a frog in 1962, or even earlier, I think, uh, it didn't make headlines, but when he became a mammal, it became big news, mm -hmm. and it was a matter of uh, intense political, moral, ethical, mm -hmm. religious debate. Um, and so I drafted a, a, um, an abstract of, of a seminar on yes. cloning. What is cloning? Yes. It was a single paragraph. John Eatwell phoned up a young lad uh, called um, David Miliband. <laughs> <laughs> and David Miliband was then a very young man indeed, a head of the policy group in uh, number no, I mean, it was, that was the Institute for Public Policy uh, Research. Uh, no, not, not, not IPPS, no, no, he was head of the Prime Minister's Policy Unit in Oh, the sorry, later, office. yes, that's right, yes, yes, because he, he... He had been uh, with IPPS. I, I, I got to know him there, yes, uh, uh, yes that's right, yes, that's they, right. They, they, they joined the Cabinet Office. They joined the Cabinet Office. Yeah. And John knew him quite well, oh, very well. Yes. And, <laughs> in fact, he was responsible for giving him his first job, as he claims repeatedly to me. <laughs> uh, it's true, yeah. because David Miliband said so the other day when he was here. Um, and and um, uh, as I later learned, David M Miliband took it or to Richard Wilson, who was then cabinet secretary, who took it to prime minister. And they all thought this was a good idea, that there should be a seminar. And I'd sent this abstract of a seminar on cloning, which I knew was, of course, mm -hmm. a very, sure. very hot issue. Yeah. Um, that Saturday, I saw a headline in the newspaper, Prime Minister in, to, to consult scientific advice, advisor. And I, I suspected it was us, and indeed it has been confirmed to me since the, the scientific people who were going to consult was whilst this seminar group. Yes. So with that, we started it off, and we purloined the money. This is another joyous thing. Uh, we were able to do this independently of the university. Yes. Uh, each of us put in, I think, uh, the only cost to us was putting on the sandwiches. Because I got local people yes. to speak at this meeting. Uh, John Gurdon. Uh, no, John couldn't. Martin Evans came. Yes. And uh, um, uh, and uh, our, our honorary fellow. Mammalian reproductive biologist, who was foreign secretary of the Royal Society. This is really good. Brian. No, and Anne McLaren. Anne McLaren. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Anne McLaren. No, she was a speaker, brilliant speaker. She was. Mm. Anyway, was, I've got this galaxy of people speaking, but they're most mm. of them, all most of them, I think, all were, were, were local people. Um, and so, it, all it cost us was to put, put, was for lunch for these big wings. Yes. And um, they were Richard Wilson and the. The Permanent Secretary of Cabinet came, the Permanent Secretary of Treasury came. And John Eatwell's view was that if we only had those two, that would be enough to justify the meeting. Yes. We had uh, some, uh, there's 15 Permanent Secretaries, and we had about four of them then. The, the number, the last one I had last week was eight of them. I mean, more, more than half the Permanent Secretaries yes. turned up. Um, and um, uh, so they came, and a minister came, I've forgotten which minister came. Uh, it was very successful, you could tell from animation yes. and the interactions 
extraordinary things as social interactions. Uh, I insist that the coffee break is half an hour when there's no incursion, no, no speakers yes, go over time. Yes. And that allows people to go and have coffee and mix. Yes, absolutely. And then uh, uh, lunches are sandwich lunches, no, no wine, just mm. sandwich lunch and orange juice mm. and just sparkling yes. water, not sparkling water. And, and people sit very informally around tables. Alec Brewers used to come. He always supported it. He was really remarkable turnabout. He, he backed off. He backed off and he was very, yeah. very, he even, he even opened the very first seminar, yeah. he spoke the very first seminar. Um, and uh, uh, so, so they went off very well. It cost us, the bill for the sandwiches was, uh, and, the, and the, uh, it was a thousand pounds in total, the cost. And uh, each of us as head used 250 pounds from our uh, head of houses entertainment allowance. We didn't seek permission from our our, uh, our college councils. We just knew it was our entertainment allowance, and that's yes. it was how it was spent. And of course, that flexibility was something um, absolutely wonderful. So the whole drive for these, and they've been yes. roughly two every year, uh, uh, on topics to do with science, to yes. do with on, gov on society yes. and on government policy, um, they have been, by I would say, by any standard, successful, probably very successful, um, and. Um, uh, I, I was, and, and in fact, I was asked to take the the, the Scottish government has become interested mm -hmm. in having them there, and so they asked me if I would take a group one seminar yes. to Scotland to show how it was done, and the first minister indeed to show that he wished yes. from on the political side for this to have his blessing. He entertained us for dinner. This was a few weeks ago, and we we had the seminar on stem cells. In, 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 I took took a group across to China. Of, of scientists to uh, to do the sort of thing yes. that we do, and um, uh, I, so so that it is beginning to fan out as yes. a means of bringing scientists and those who really yes. uh, uh, take decisions at government level uh, to meet with scientists yes. to understand the nature of science as well. This is part of it; it's the educational component of it, yes. and in fact. Uh, about halfway through this, David King, who now had become chief science advisor, mm. had been headhunted from my, my group, and Martin Rees uh, uh, has sat in on his vacancy in, in the core committee. Um, uh, David King said uh, he, he thought he got the Prime Minister interested in science. Mm. Would I get a group of people together to go to number 10 and make a presentation to the Prime Minister? Mm. Well, I got four. Uh, four of, look through the list, uh, uh, instead of taking a coherent mm. theme, I just took four topics with four really outstanding speakers. Um, Andy, Hop per I, Andy Hopper, that's right, the uh, co computer scientist. Mm. Um, Trevor Robbins on drugs of addiction. Um, oh, the, we just, the, the professor, the um, Cavendish professor, of uh, physics, uh, Richard Friend, Sir Richard Friend, and Katie Core on epidemiology mm -hmm. uh, of uh, mm -hmm. medical mm -hmm. history. And these two, uh, uh, these, these four people. Now, um, before we have our seminars on a day, we get the speak. we will have got the speakers together to meet, to discuss their abstracts, to discuss what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. So we know really, so the thing fits together. Mm -hmm. And they are communicating at a level that a non-technical mm. person can understand. It's absolutely vital, difficult to get a scientist to do that, but we, we do do that. And we do a dry run the day before. It's amazing. Usually the dry run, they, the people are just hopeless. They, mm. they just, uh, they will speak as if they're speaking to a scientific audience. Yes. And uh, so these four, we had gone through our machine, as it were. Yes. And uh, we went, to, I went with these four to, mm. to number 10. And I sat beside the Prime Minister for three hours. Um, Dave King was there, um, Dave Sanders was there, um, and the Prime Minister. And, and these four people gave us a talk, half an hour each. And the Prime Minister was absolutely enraptured by it. He listened, and he not only listened, but he was actually very impressive. <laughs> I was very impressed by him because he listened, he summarized at the end mm. what they had said, do I understand this correctly? And he gave a very, very good, clear summary of what they had said. I was greatly impressed by him. 
And David said to me that this is the acid test. If this fails, then he's not going to go along with the scientific mm. route. Well, it clearly didn't fail. The mm. Prime Minister, as you know, gave a, a talk to the Royal Society sure, yes, supporting yes. science. Mm. And he has been, and Gordon Brown is also strongly in favour of, mm. of science. So, uh, in part, I think it is, it derives from this Cambridge University government policy yeah. programme, where we not only do science, but we look at the ethical implications of the mm. science, the social, legal, um, yes. moral. Uh, Nora O'Neill often speaks yes. at, at our meetings. So they seem to, the uh, foresight programmes, which you know is the method the government is using to look at future development in mm. science and how they're going to impinge on policy yeah. and then spend. I mean, it actually affects government policy. They're based on the gov our seminars, the whole system of looking at the science yes. and then going on to the, the legal side, the ethical side and the social side. Yes. That's all based upon the Cudpop seminars. So it did rub off on Mandarin's. I mean, yes, it, do, it did and it does. Uh, oh, I had yeah. one last Friday. I had one. I, I, I seem so paternalistic to it. I mean, it, it, of course, I, it's a core committee that does, but I, yeah. I do, I do, I, I, yeah, I do the work with it and mm. get the people together. Um, and I had one on migration last Friday against all the odds because uh, our feeling was there's no science in migration. Mm. And I said, look, there is science in migration. Uh, why do animals, why do animals, uh, uh, an there are rules that apply to animals and to humans as well. I mean, uh, it w it, animals will move when there's no food or water, mm. where there's an inadequate resource, to where there is an abundance. So there are, if you call those economic factors, there are driving forces and pulling forces as reproduction. And, 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 and there are parallels in human reproduction where you say, well, I want to bring my child up safely. What does that mean? It, but reproductive success, mm. and you can use what's going on in, in biological sci in biological sciences as a key to understand what is going on in uh, this dispersal yes. migration mm. of human populations. <coughs> and we had the largest turnout of permanent secretaries ever last Friday. Eight out of the fifteen turned up, and I, I've already I'm getting letters flowing back. This mm. morning I had to reply to them, so I'm a bit late. Um, very great appreciation for these yes, seminars right. and, and requesting the slides and mm. PowerPoint so they can distribute to their various departments. And in fact, the minister responsible uh, chaired the general discussion and said he promised that he would take forward to government policy the outcomes of what had been presented that day. Who do you have as speakers? Oh, some people that we saw. I usually phone up and start off from a call, spending a lot of time. Yes. So first, first, yes. who are the best people in the field? Yes. Then if I've got a serious choice, are they any, any good at speaking? Yes. And then I will come to the core committee and I say, look, I've got these, 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 these names. And, and mm. So it takes a, I often get input from core committee, yes. you know, like I'm a physical scientist from Martin Rees. Bob Heppel will suggest someone in law. Yes. And so I, yes. I manage to get these inputs. And yes. then, then there's the problem of convincing the lecturers, especially migration, Yes. But someone who is talking about frogs and insects and birds mm. is uncovering general rules that apply to humans yes. and convincing a social scientist that this is the case. Yes. Um, well, I, 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 think it, I think it was the case. They, they, they went away tremendously yes. animated by the discussions. Uh, you could tell the discussions yes. were so yes. animated. Um, so I. I was thinking of closing it down actually because the amount of work that it entails on my part is enormous. Well, yes. But um, but if, if there continues to be pressure from the government to want yes. it, I'm prepared to, to go on doing it. I mean, when you started it, it must have been kind of treading on the toes of, of, of the chief scientific advisor at the time. Uh, well, there by hands a tail. <laughs> yes, there by hands a tail. Uh, the chief scientific advisor. Um, Bob May. Bob May. Uh, I had no idea what I had stirred up because one day, uh, when all was going well, and uh, uh, at the beginning of it, when we yes. got the clear from number 10, mm. uh, yes, we got the date fixed, I got a, a, a phone call from the chief scientific advisor, Bob May. He just returned from transatlantic flight and was jet lagged. And he was much put out. <laughs> and if I say that Bob May was cross, 
you will understand what I mean because mm. he is a man that's given to a four letter word in abundance mm. Mm. Uh, given his Australian origins whereupon what I did was to introduce me to the fact that as if I needed an introduction I come from Australia he said meant, which meant he was now going to abuse me down the phone <laughs> <laughs> which he proceeded to do and, and there was this, and this dreadful row between the two of us and I kept saying to Bob he said you're undermining my position in government why didn't you do why didn't you approach me I thought, well, if I'd approached you, you'd put it at the bottom of a pile, of course. <laughs> but uh, and I was undermining his position. And I said to him, look, Bob, I, th I think you're jet-lagged. I, I think you ought to go home and phone me up tomorrow. <laughs> Try to be prepared to end. He, and he said, yes, sir, you're quite right, you're quite right. And then on he went once again. It was <laughs> dreadful, dreadful. It was dreadful. It was dreadful. Uh, some weeks afterward, I got a charming letter from him. <laughs> quite a long letter saying he was very sorry he'd blown his top, that in fact I'd strengthened his position in government. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I'd strengthened his position in government, but, but uh, to give him immense credit, he always came to every seminar. He came as, as when he was chief science advisor and he came as president of the Royal Society. Yes. Every president of the Royal Society has been to the seminars. Yes. Uh, Aaron Klug came and then uh, he came and then, uh, and uh, well, of course Martin comes because he's a Yes. He's on the committee. Yes, yes. Well, congratulations. Story, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 story. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Um, almost there. Um, can you say anything about the current inquiry you're doing for the um, Academy of Medicine? Yes. Um, for the what? Academy of Medicine, sorry. Oh, yes, right. Yes. Um, this brings me full, full circle to Keith Peters, really, and the affection to regard I think we probably have for each other. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, received a letter from him uh, and, 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 and saying that the government, which was in fact the Office of Science and Innovation, and in fact it was David Sainsbury and David King, uh, and the Minister of Health, had been looking at the, out, the output of a tremendously substantial review, a foresight project that is, on brain sciences, mm. addiction, and drugs, medicines for mental health. Mm. And th this review, which was not meant to make recommendations, but to review the field. Uh, but the field was so important, mm. development so, as it were, nascent, ready to explode out mm. in all sorts of ways, that they decided they wished a committee to be established to look into the implications and to carry this foresight project forward and to make recommendations to the government on developments in brain sciences, sciences addiction, medicines for mental health, uh, looking at the implications right across the benefits, advantages and disadvantages for the individuals and the community and society. And it was a a very tall order, and I don't know where my name came from. I have an idea, it probably came from the minister, but I don't know where my name came from. But anyway, it, the, the, uh, the government had decided that the lead department should be the Department of Health. And the Department of Health was decided, had decided to put, instead of giving this inquiry to the Royal Society, which was the usual thing to do, they thought they'd see if the Academy of Medical Sciences, how will they deal with this? Yes. So in, in a way, the Academy of Medical Sciences is, is, uh, is being watched to see how they, which is we, will yes. perform. And uh, so Keith wrote and asked me if I'd chair this meeting, chair a working group. Mm. Um, as I say, I think that my name came from within the government. Uh, and I, well, I ultimately accepted that I would, but I wanted complete freedom to appoint whoever, who, whomsoever I chose to appoint. Provided, of course, the Academy of Medical Sciences mm. said yes, they all we accept them. I mean, unless, unless they had grounds for yes. thinking they were below par. So that went uh, that went uh, that went well. It took about six months to get the people together, and we've been going now for about a year and, and a quarter. And and uh, I'm hoping that we'll report by by the end of the year. Mm. But it's, it's going to be quite a difficult job. And <coughs> we are looking at developments in brain sciences. Yes and how they're likely to impinge on the development of medicines for the treatment of, of, uh, of, um, of addiction, really. 
but of course the brief goes beyond that um, uh, because we've just given this very broad brief mm. and I took this is an interesting for me anyway the interesting aspect of my my own personal um, journey through life is yes. the benefit of having read medicine was given to me yeah. <coughs> because I saw the approach to this as basically one of public health mm -hmm. that um, rather than rather than see addiction as something that is essentially criminological there is a huge criminological component to it um, uh, as a public health problem uh, so you in, in looking at public health problem you say well what are the causes yes. uh, once a disease is struck of course you're, in, you're, you're often very difficult to treat it <coughs> so the thing to do with the disease is to prevent the disease happening in the first place yes. so I got um, a, a child psychiatrist and a child psychologist on my committee and they have been reviewing risk factors for the later addictive behaviour yes. and that's been a is being an amazing voyage um, and it ha will have I'm quite sure implications right the way through government policy and I have already submitted an interim report which I've drawn the attention and I, and I, I gave a talk to a, a cross-government uh, meeting of ministers um, last December and they the minister who chaired it wanted my report so she could act on it and I said well you can't have it because <laughs> because I can't report for another year until the end of the year and so a big problem arose because there are clear implications of what we've done so far for um, for children mm -hmm. the well-being of children in the country uh, for the care of children in the country, the education of children in the country, the preschool education of children, the care of pregnant mm. women. Um, um, quite apart from anything else, because there are criminological yes. aspects as well, I'm not mm, touching on them now. But that is a very clear effect. And when I got on to it, I could see the minister suddenly set up. And that's when she became very interested when I got round to the public health issues and what the government actually could do. Yes. Um, apart from becoming more efficient if they could be with on the legal yes. on the law side by way of prevention yes. and so um, Dave King who was uh, there representing the Office of Science and Innovation said well could we produce an interim report mm. well I said well I, we could as long as it was understood that that interim report would be subject to modification if we thought it was necessary in the light of new knowledge sure, and sure, yes. our consultations with the public so they have it in their hands, mm -hmm. and uh, I have noticed that in the in the um, in the Chancellor's uh, budget recently, a massive expenditure on the welfare of children. And uh, I, because I don't know whether my document fed into that level, it may very well have done so, because uh, and I, I I felt it was very regrettable that the the press has got hold of uh, after the budget. The, the, the things to do with motor taxation, sure, and a reduction of two p in the in the in the pound uh, tax, and and failed to pick up the massive shift of support yes. for children. And Are you doing about gambling, by the way? Gambling does come into it. Should, yeah. shouldn't it? Yes. yes, gambling does come into yeah. it. We we have uh, yes, we have been looking at gambling, and yeah. I did include in my interim report yeah. some data on. The brain areas involved yeah. in gambling, and they're the same as the brain areas that are involved exactly. in addiction. Yes. Uh, and uh, in fact, a drug <coughs> that is helpful in uh, uh, people who are heroin addicts, unpleasantly so, but helpful heroin addicts, is also helpful in in, uh, in, yeah. in treating gambling yes. addictions. So there's no doubt that there, there's an a area of, of overlap. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So it's it it's got. It's, it's, it's as a product, it's got way beyond brain science. It's, mm. go, it's, it's gone right into medicine, it's gone yes. right into social science, education. It's barely an area that, as it were, of society that this is not going to be impinging on. So this big epigenetic effect, too, I mean, go not only to the mother, but also to the father. And there's a Russian data on this, which, which is extraordinary. If a father is an addict, they can have effects on their offspring. Uh, yes, you mentioned this to me. Uh, certainly, there is some evidence that, and I have to be careful about quoting it, but I, but I have seen reference to it in our, the, the document yes. submitted by Eric Taylor, the child yes. psychiatrist, on, 
his, his report includes reference to um, uh, um, twin studies and fostering studies um, in which the, um, the behaviour of the genetic parents in res parents, yes. by the way, yes. in respect of drug taking, is a larger determinant of the their offspring's yes. um, behaviour in drug taking than their foster parents. So there clearly is a yep. genetic effect. Yep. Um, whether he says it's father and mother, I don't know, but there's clearly a parental effect there that that is. The mother would be less surprising, but, but, but the, the yes. father effect is quite, I mean, and, and, and it's, it's quite a large effect. Right? Anyway, sorry, uh, uh, we, 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 must, we must move on, but that's, that's, again, it's another fascinating story. Um, almost there. Um, when you came back to Cambridge and, and, and you and Prill built the house house at Blair, and, um, and that sort of established a kind of new life for you in a way. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean I, and you'd been an urban person as, 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 a, as a child and, and then of course in Bristol you had this lovely house. And, um, I mean, how did you feel about sort of becoming a country person? <laughs> well, I had, I, had, uh, I had the cameraman uh, as my guide because he comes from the village of Lowe, which is where <laughs> I lived, and he was very happy to settle there. Uh, um, th th that uh, is entirely due to my wife, really, I mean that. And I've adapted, I hope, very well, but yeah. I've never become a farmer, but, <laughs> but, uh, and nor have I become a gardener. Uh, mm. But um, uh, I, you know, in a sense, my regret. That those are things I never seem to have had time for. Um, but uh, Prill, Prill wanted Prill when we were living in in uh, in Bristol. She brought her horse across to Bristol, and the horse um, was kept in a lo beautiful field in a mm. lovely part of just outside yes. Bristol and absolutely wonderful part of the countryside. And when we came to Cambridge, uh, we parked the horse in some field outside Cambridge for, mm. for a time while we lived in, in Cambridge. And then Prill was looking for somewhere and said she always had wanted to live in a, in a home where she could get up in the morning and see her horse in her own field. Mm. And my marvellous secretary, Chris Percival, I'd been talking to her about this, and she'd spotted a piece of land at a place called yeah. Lode I'd never heard of. And there was a barn there with some land, an acre and a bit of land. And that was, we, that was, that was the point of no return. Yeah. And in fact, I took to it well in this sense that uh, after we had arrived, a, a companion horse came for Pearl's horse. And I was taught to ride, and I think I first rode a horse when I was 51 or 52, <laughs> I think, something of that sort. Uh, uh. And I then rode for the next 20 odd years and, uh, um, and, and greatly enjoyed it. But I'd never ridden before. I may have been yeah. on a donkey or something like that <laughs> at, the, at the seaside, but I've never <laughs> been on a horse before. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, in that sense, I think I took to it very well. Yeah. Yes. I love it. I mean, the, the disadvantage of... of um, is, there is a serious disadvantage. Uh, they, we, we, we haven't touched on kings or anything, or the, or the, the reason why one still wants to... Yes, you know, I still do my research, um, but why does one still like to keep up um, one's connection with, with, with the fellowship? And the yes. answer, of course, is because it is so immensely rewarding yeah. in so many, many ways. The disadvantage of living out in the countryside, of course, is that if you've had a glass of wine, and I, I don't drink and drive, and I... No. Um, so. I would go home by bus, yeah. and then they've changed the bus schedule, you see, so I can't go home. I, I have to go home improved by taxi. They've improved it Well, they've, they've improved it by not in, you know, dropping off some of, some of the, yes. the buses that I would have conveniently yes. taken, so I have to take a taxi, and that's more expensive. So that, that, that is a constraint that I regret. Mm. Um, but apart from that, it's, it's wonderful to live in a completely different world. It's a truly different world. Mm. Our next-door neighbours are farmers, and mm. Really, really are farmers. Mm. They're, um, they've been farmers for generations, and they're they're not rich. They're tenant farmers. So we we mix with a completely different group of people, and that's that's broadening. It mm. broadens one's horizons in the, in the best of all possible ways. We could perhaps come back to things again, but but um, I wanted to ask you a rather more personal thing. I mean, 
you, you've been extremely ill on a number of occasions. And, you know, I, mean, it, 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 I think you, you, you totally came nearly came, came close to dying. And yet you bounced with incredible vigour. And, and, and I mean, what drove you through that? I mean, could, did, or, or did, was it just sort of that you, you recovered your, your sense of uh, wanting to do things? I mean, or was it even motivating? I mean, that, that you'd had these very nasty experiences and, 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 and very nearly uh, died? I mean, um, yes, I did nearly die on a couple of occasions, or maybe three actually, in that, in that decade of 1990, never having really been ill all my life. Uh, and one occasion was, I was very lucky to be alive, I had a massive hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I can say one thing, that before I answer you directly, uh, I never turned to religion. I, I was really true to myself. Yes. Uh, uh, um, I never, uh, although knowing that I might very well die, I never actually felt I, this is the moment I better get myself converted to Judaism properly or something like that. Yeah. And never actually crossed my no. mind. Uh, um, and I've always thought, well, I hope that if on my deathbed I, I, I do something funny like that, everyone will understand that it doesn't mean anything at all, that it's just... That's <laughs> 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 absolutely right. Um, but it, that, that yeah. didn't happen at all. Um, my concern, I was really concerned about the, uh, about Prill and my children. I, that, that really concerned me about their, their, their sense of, of loss, yes. you know, I mean, because they inevitably would have felt that. Um, was I driven? There was only one occasion which I was driven, um, and that was um, uh, uh, Prince Philip was going to come t to, to Sydney um, to open, formally to open, a building for which I had obtained the money. And so I'd, I'd found two and a half million pounds and uh, we got this building designed and we spent a lot of time on mm -hmm. it and it's a very handsome little building. Um, um, all purpose for undergraduates, mm -hmm. music yes. to, and, and, and seminars and all, all sorts of things. Uh, and the Queen had unveiled the foundation stone in 15... In, well, not 1996. <laughs> <laughs> 1996. There it, had, <laughs> there it had been, you see, mm -hmm. until it was, it, and it was, the Prince was going to come in, I think, March of 1999. I was going to retire as Master in July in 1999, and I was very keen to be present. And Tim Cox was my physician, and he did everything he possibly could. That was the worst of all my illnesses. Um, so that was certainly a driver. I did yeah. want to yes. be there, and I did manage yeah. to get there. I don't know, Pat, actually, there was anything as dramatic as a driver, in, 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 even, perhaps even then. Um, um, uh, what happens when you get very ill? Um, If you're, if you're very ill and get very weak, then you lose interest in a lot of things yes. and you, you, you see your family, which is the thing that gives you pleasure, mm -hmm. and, um, and thoughts about your close friends. Mm -hmm. um, but other things, sort of, the cerebral function is not adequate to cope with things beyond that. And as one gets better, <coughs> one, one's intellect begins to tick over again mm -hmm. and really you become not a super self, but you become yourself. Um, at least I found that for me anyway, mm. and I and the things that had always almost compulsively driven me, I would begin then to go beyond my family, and I begin then to think that, <coughs> that paper I was supposed to be writing, or I begin to think of um, that lecture <coughs> I should be giving, yes. or that speech I had to give. So things were, in a sense, back to normal. It's an extraordinary thing. It, it isn't. A, it isn't a force that says I'm going to survive. One. Well, if you're of that, well, I suppose I was that kind of, when, when in a state of survival, I want to go on doing the things I want to do. I was going to say, because I mean, some people would give up. I mean, they, they, suddenly they, you know, they, 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 they sort of stop trying to, to survive, and, and you clearly didn't. I mean, you, uh, well, I think it could happen, you know. Yeah. Um, there was one occasion when I was hemorrhaging, um, and I was getting weaker and weaker, and the, the nurse finally saw the evidence yes. of my hemorrhaging. Uh, and then all bells were rung and suddenly there was the, the anaesthetist that had been pulled up from the theatre and there was a, a large 
large number of doctors and nurses were around my bed putting up drips. And I watched this in the most disinterested way. Disinterested way. Mm. Um, I was aware that it was me and the, we were doing these things for me. I was not worried. I was not concerned. I knew it was serious, but I didn't take it on board how serious it was. I just knew this was very serious and I might die, but it didn't bother me very much at all. I was possibly too weak, as I say, for all those sort of the cerebral machinery mm. of anguish to be engaged. I didn't. It wasn't engageable because I think it was not, not capable of working. I was probably so deoxygenated through lack of blood that a sort of peace, a sort of tranquility comes over, came over me. And I watched this quite mm. disinterestedly, mm. yes. without any kind of fear. At least I'm not a brave person. It's nothing to do with bravery. You just watch it because you you were, uh, you, the, the, as I say, the machinery of the of the brain it, it, it is not triggered to the point at which the fear mechanism yes. is engaged. Yes. Maybe it is with some people, but mine weren't. Uh, and I was just interested to see these people coming and going and running around, running around my bed and getting anxious and oh. whistles blowing, as it were. But it was a disinterested, quiet step. Interesting.